guys? I didn't need that anyway. How's it going? Good. All right, awesome. So uh, we're going to talk today. Um, what we're doing is a series called God Questions. Somebody say God Questions. God Questions. All right. So what we're doing is uh, four weeks before Easter, each week we're handling one of the big God questions that people have. And, and we hear a lot of questions. And the places that we teach, we hear a lot of awesome, uh, honest questions. If people will, you know, speak up and ask them, we hear a lot of honest questions. And so what we're going to be talking about today, and you might have guessed it, is this. What is Judgment Day? We want to know the truth about Judgment Day. Uh, who here knows of a movie about Judgment Day, a current, some, some kind of recent movie, 10, 15 years old? What do you got, Gene? Judgment Day. Judgment Day, all right. That's one of them. Yeah, that, that's easy. Anybody got a tougher one? Come on, it's all twisted in Hollywood. What, what, what do you got? 24? 20, 2012, yeah, right, okay. That was the scariest movie I ever saw. Yeah, that's right. Anybody else? Independence Day. Independence Day, okay, all right. Armageddon. Armageddon, okay, good, good. All right, so what we're getting here is an idea that uh, it gets talked about a lot. Are you with me? It's tossed about uh, a lot, and uh, people are always talking about it, wondering about it. But... <laughs> Just like uh, Ray and whatever his name is there in, in Ghostbusters, how many of you know that, that that was not, what he just quoted even from Revelation is not Judgment Day. It's a judgment, but it's not Judgment Day. Are you with me? Yeah. Judgment Day is a specific day, and we'll get to that right toward the end of the message, and we'll get real specific about exactly what that is. But what we want to do is we want to understand it, and we want to be clear on it, we want to know exactly what it is, and then we can make a decision about it. Does that sound right? All right, great. So what I want to do is I want to take you to uh, a passage that talks a little about Judgment Day, but what it does is really explains to us what the whole idea is behind Judgment Day. Acts chapter 17. And if you have an outline, that would be great for you to follow along. If you have a Bible, that's great. You can open to Acts 17. If you don't have an outline, we'd love for you to go back on the Welcome Center and grab one. You're going to want to uh, go through your outline, and, and don't be shy. Run back there and get one, please. Uh, you're going to want it to get a hold of some of this stuff. I'm going to begin reading at verse 16, and we're going to just kind of bounce around for a few verses so we get the idea, but then 19 through 31 is going to be a complete story. Sound like a deal? Yeah. All right, here we go. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens. So what you have in just the first sentence there is, Paul is a missionary of Jesus Christ. He's a... He's a, an apostle, he's a person who's been called by Jesus to speak to other people about Jesus, and uh, he's waiting for his ministry team in the city of Athens. Now, Athens is a city uh, that worships all kinds of other gods, Greek gods, and so Jesus is really not known there. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols that he saw everywhere in the city. So, by all the other beliefs, he was deeply troubled. Amen? Amen. All right. Uh, verse 17, he went to the synagogue, that's the Jewish place of worship, to reason with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and he spoke daily in the public square to all who happened to be there. And verse 19, then they took him to the high council of the city. Uh, Come and tell us about this new teaching, they said. You are saying some rather strange things, and we want to know what it's all about. It's good when somebody asks questions. Verse 21, it should be explained that all the Athenians, all the people in that city, as well as the foreigners in Athens, seem to spend all their time discussing the latest ideas. So it was one of those hubs, a place where people came to talk about uh, all their beliefs. In verse 22, so Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way. For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines, and one of your altars had this inscription on it, To an unknown God, this God whom you worship without knowing is the one I'm telling you about. He is the God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't live in man-made temples, and human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. 
From one man he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and exist. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And since this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times, but now he commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to him. For he has set a day. A day. Somebody say a day. A day. a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed, and he has proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. All right, so let's go back to the beginning for a minute, the beginning of that passage, and notice right off the bat that Paul is, uh, uh, again, a missionary of Jesus Christ, and he's walking around the city, and he's troubled. Somebody say troubled. Trouble. Why is he troubled? He's troubled because he sees all of these people worshiping other gods. Are you with me? It's important. Are you with me? Yeah. All right. And, and so what we see right off the bat is that he is troubled by this, and the reason that he's troubled by this is he is a, he knows Jesus. He personally has a relationship with Jesus Christ. He believes that Jesus is the way. In fact, Jesus, he knows that Jesus said this. Jesus said, I am the way, the way. How many of you understand that means one way? Are you with me? I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. Now, what I'd like you to just think about for a minute is this. If Jesus said this, and Jesus did say this, then we have a choice about what we believe, and it can't be believing in everything. Are you with me? It just simply, come on now, are you with me? Uh, the problem is that it, Jesus is either a nutcase, like C.S. Lewis said, he's an absolute nutcase because he says, I'm the only way, or he's telling the truth. So you can't go in between and say he's just one of the good ways, because that's not true. It can't be true. Jesus is either the way, or he's not a way at all. Now, Paul believed that he was the way. He believed that Jesus was the way to God because Jesus said he was. And, uh, by the way, Paul had personally met him after he was resurrected, so he had reason to believe that. And so, he believed that he was the way, the one and only way to God. And so, obviously, because he cared about people, he was deeply troubled when he saw all of these people worshiping something else. Are you with me? Deeply troubled. See, what we're talking about today is, is Judgment Day. And I want you to think about something. When we think about Judgment Day, what we're talking about is you're going to spend eternity in one of two places. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to have to tell you the truth about this. And, 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 and you know, more questions get asked about Judgment Day than anything else. I, we go out and we teach in, in some of the centers around town, and one of the questions that I've asked as I've taught in those places is, I, I've asked the question, whether you believe in God or not, whether you believe in Jesus or not, how many of you know deep down inside, someplace inside of you, that there's going to be a judgment? And to date, I've never in my life had anybody say, no, I, I don't feel like that. Everybody has something inside of them, deny it or not, everybody has something inside of them that says one day there's going to be a judgment. The fact of the matter is, you have to be understanding that you're going to live someplace forever. Anybody with me? You're going to live someplace forever. It's going to be one or two places. And so, you know, Jesus saying, I'm the only way, is, is something that we have to settle in ourselves. What is it we're going to do with that? Are you tracking? What is it that I'm going to do with that? So he was deeply troubled because he was concerned about other people worshiping other things that weren't going to take them to God. It wasn't going to take them to God. So what did he do? He went out and he began telling people about Jesus. He went to the places that he could to tell people about Jesus, to let them make the decision so that they would know that there's, there is an opportunity to come to God. Are you with me? 
All right, and so he, he goes to these different places and then God opens some new doors and he ends up being able to go to the council and really kind of have an opportunity to really change the city. What a great uh, opportunity that he has to be able to change the city. Now here's what he says. Watch this now. Somebody say, I'll watch. So he goes to the city. He says, men of Athens, I noticed that you're very religious. As I was walking along, I see your many shrines. Now watch this. One of your altars has this inscription on it, to an unknown God. This God whom you worship without knowing is the one that I am telling you about. First thing you see there is that Paul somehow makes a bridge to these people who don't necessarily believe in Jesus. Anybody home with me? He makes a bridge. Now, depending on what side of Jesus you're on right here, the thing that you need to be thinking about it is, is this. It, it, either you know Jesus, and, and that means that you are uh, really identifying with the fact that you're troubled by other beliefs because you care about people. Maybe you don't know Jesus, and you're wondering why people would be troubled, and it's because they care about you. Are you with me? So when people love you enough to tell you the truth, it's because they care deeply about you. So he comes to him and he says, this God that you've been worshiping, this, this shrine that you have, this altar that you have, it's to an unknown God. You have it scribed right on it, but it's to an unknown God. And what I want you to know is that, that this unknown God is the God that I'm going to talk to you about. Anybody here understand that a great many of us worship a God that we don't know? Anybody home with that? Do you understand what I'm saying? Here, here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about um, we make up God as we go along. In other words, uh, I don't have a clue what the Bible says about God. I don't have a clue what God says about God. I don't have any idea what God says about God, but I've decided that this is who God is, and this is how He works, and, and this is how He functions. In fact, you know, here's what I want. I, I want a God that's going to help me out of my addiction. I want a God that's going to help me put my family back together. I want a God that's going to rescue me. But what I don't want is a God that's going to interfere in the things that I want to be involved in. I don't want a God that's going to mess with my personal life. Anybody home? And so what we do is we kind of make up God as we go along. And maybe some of us don't really even want to know what God has to say about God, who He really is. But do you understand what it would be like if, if you were trying to have a friendship with somebody and, and you decided, you know what, I don't even want to know you, I'm just going to decide what you're like? Would that work very well? If you're going to have a relationship with God, you need to know who God is. And that's what He's telling these guys. He's telling them, look, you have this this, this shrine that says to an unknown God. You don't even know Him, but you've been worshiping Him. Listen, listen, listen. You don't even know Him, but you've been worshiping Him. And then He says there's, there's a few things that you might want to think about if you're somebody who's kind of been making up God as you go along, deciding who God is. Here's a few things to think about. Because God wants you to know Him. So here's some things to think about. You ready? Ready? First thing is this. God is not contained by your man-made temples. The first thing that he says about God is that God can't simply be contained by the things that we make or we make up or we build. That's, that's not who God is. We don't have a church building so that God can live in a church building. We have a church building so that we can meet and we can hopefully come and meet with God. But God doesn't live in buildings. No matter who you are, understand that God's Word says right here, at verse 24 in your story, that He doesn't live in man-made temples. Even if you've been part of a religion at some point that says, we're going to build giant temples so when Jesus comes back, He'll have a place to go, God's Word says that doesn't work. God doesn't live in those places because man can't build something that can contain God. Anybody home? The next thing that he says is God is in sovereign control of everything. 
Think about this. God wants you to know Him. If you're making up God as you go along, you need to understand that God is in absolutely sovereign control over everything there is. Verse 26. What's He say? He created all the nations. Not only did He create all the nations, but He decided which ones were going to rise and which ones were going to fall. And he decided what their boundaries would be. And so while men and women are scurrying around trying to make sure that their kingdoms grow, God's the one that's in control of all that. How many of you have tried to do something that didn't work? <laughs> How many of you have had, you've looked at it and you've said, there's no good reason why that didn't work? Here's the reason. God is in control of everything. And I want to tell you something. Just a little side note for you. <laughs> what you need to do when something doesn't work is step back and say, okay, God, why did you not want that to work for me? And by the way, thank you for saving me from whatever you saved me from. <laughs> the next thing he says is, everything is for the purpose of you and I knowing him. Everything. Somebody say everything. Everything. <laughs> Everything is. What does he say at verse 27? His purpose in all of this was that the nation should seek after him and feel their way toward him and find him. Somebody say and find him. He's in sovereign control over everything. He controls everything in your life. A lot of things don't work very well. And the purpose for that is that you would seek after him and find him. When we find out we're not in control, the next logical thing to do is to seek the one who is. Are you with me? And that's what God says. That's the, the, everything is for the purpose of you knowing Him. And fourth, the fourth thing to think about is that God is knowable. See, some of us think that I'll never know God because God is just simply not knowable. That's not true. Look at what He says here. He says, we... He, he, excuse me, uh, verse 27 at the end, we, though he's not far from any one of us. Though he's not far from any one of us. What does that mean? It means that when I do decide to seek God, when I do decide that I really can know God, he's not very far away. I find out he's right there and he is knowable. I can know him. Now I can make up all the excuses I want to about not being able to know God, but the truth is he's knowable. Do you have any idea why Jesus came to the earth and lived for 33 years? And there was silence. Oh, well, why didn't he just do that? There you go. He lived for 33 years so we could know God. John chapter 1 says this. It says, he came for the purpose of living a life so that we could see who God is. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and, and, and the Word was God. Now listen, listen very closely. What he's saying there is this. You can know who God is. That, that was the whole purpose of Jesus living the life. All you have to do is, Jesus said, if, you know, if you've known me, you can know the Father. So you take a look at Jesus and you say, okay, I can know God. I, I can understand how God interacts with people. I can understand uh, why, what God gets angry about. I can understand what God smiles about. I can understand what it's like to have a relationship with Him because I can look at Jesus. That was God's purpose in Jesus' life. Not only can I know how to live, but I can know who God is. He is knowable. Somebody say knowable. Oh. I made that word up. I don't know if it's a real word. Verse 5. He made you. He made you. He made you. You are not scum from a pond. He made you. You didn't come from primordial ooze. He made you. And what did He make you for? The reason it's so important for you to know that God hand made you is this. He made you for that purpose, to know Him. Are you with me? What does it say here? It says... Uh, the end of verse 28, we are his offspring. We are his offspring. 
Yes, an Athenian Greek poet wrote that who didn't even know Jesus. But then Paul says right afterwards, and since this is true, how many of you know that we have it inside of us, that there's a hole inside of us that says there is a God and I was made for it? And, and no matter where you run, no matter what you try to fill your life with, guess what? You still know that you were made by Him and for Him, for a relationship with Him. You know it. Somebody say, I know it. That's what we were made for. We are His offspring. Offspring are made for a relationship with their parent. You're going to be God's kid for the rest of your life. The last thing that he says, number six, is kind of a conclusionary statement. Are you with me? You shouldn't think of God as something or someone that you can make up. God wants you to actually know Him. He doesn't want you to make Him up as you go along. He wants you to actually know Him. And that's what he says here at uh, verse 29. We shouldn't think of God as something that's designed by men. We shouldn't think of a God that uh, God as something that we can create. Amen? With all that in mind, there's no way I can think of God as something that I can create. Instead, He created me and He created me for His purpose and that purpose is to know Him. Anybody home? Now it gets real serious. Because now we move on to why judgment is so important. He made you so that you would know Him. Here's what I'd like you to do. Can you think for a moment? What you don't want to do, here's what you don't want to do in the next few minutes. Here's what you don't want to do in the next few minutes. Anybody with me? You don't want to reject what God is about to say because you're afraid. You don't want to reject it because you think, well, what about so-and-so? What about their faith? You don't want to reject it because of some personal feelings that you have. What you want to do, listen to me, what you want to do is you want to look at this. Are you hearing me? Somebody say, I'm hearing you. You want to look at this and you want to weigh this out and you want to see if God is speaking to your heart today. Are you with me? It gets serious now. Because all this is true, I want you to understand verse 30 then in the next thing. God overlooked people's ignorance about these things, about knowing Him in earlier times. But now, somebody say, but now? But now He commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to Him. What you see in that verse is a hinge point. Somehow in earlier times, God overlooked or was patient with people. He said, okay, they don't know me, and I'm going to be patient with that. Are you with me? I'm going to overlook that for now. But then at some point in history, he said, wait a second. Now, from now on, from now on, people must know me. They must turn from their sin and they must turn to me. Anybody home? Yeah, yeah. Now our question has to be, what was the point in history? What was that hinge point? When did that take place? Now watch me very closely. I want you to understand what that hinge point was. Come on now, wake up. Are you with me? Yeah, yeah. What was that hinge point? That hinge point was the cross. Watch me. The cross was the hinge point of human history. B.C., A.D., come on, are you with me? That was the hinge point of human history. So here's the thing, right in the center of human history is the cross. And on one side of it is God overlooked people knowing Him or not knowing Him. And on the other side of the cross is, now people must know me. In fact, I command them, there's no choice now, I command them, even though I was patient before, I command them that at this point, 
They must turn from their sin. This is what I like. This is my insecurities. This is my sex sin. This is my drug. This is my thing that I completely depend on. I must turn from that and turn to Jesus Christ. And when I turn to Jesus Christ, I turn to His sacrifice for me. Do you understand, guys? Listen to me very clearly and closely. The cross was a judgment. I want you to understand what it was. It was a judgment. It was a judgment of sin. And so what happened on the cross was this. All sin was judged. The wages of sin is death. And so Jesus died for our sins. It was a judgment of sin. It was all put on Him. And He died for our sins so that we might turn away from our sin and turn to Him and trust Him to pay for our sins. Is anybody home? And so that cross is the hinge point of human history. It was a judgment of sin. That's what took place there. It's not judgment day, but it was a judgment. Somebody say a judgment. Because of that, verse 31, he has set a day, a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he proved to everyone who this was who this is by raising him from the dead. So what we have here is the future. And we don't know what future. We don't know if this is tomorrow. We know that it's at the end times. We know that it is a time in our future when what happens is God Almighty sits on His great white throne. And what the Bible says is that He judges the dead. He judges the dead. I want you to understand something. If you have chosen Jesus Christ, if you have chosen to accept His sacrifice for your sins, listen. Somebody say, I'm listening. If you have chosen to accept His sacrifice for your sins, you will never see Judgment Day. You'll never see it. You will not be there. You will be happy in heaven. And you'll never see Judgment Day. But listen, listen to me closely. God, I pray that you hear this. God, I pray that the Holy Spirit speaks to you. Because if you reject the sacrifice of Jesus Christ then you have determined to be judged on your own merits. You have determined to be judged by what you do and you don't do. Anybody home with me? You have determined to be judged that way and because God is fair and God is just, He will allow you to be judged the way you want to be judged and you will be called before Him and and you will be judged on what you do and don't do. But watch this now. You say, well, I've lived a pretty good life. Here's the problem with that. We're going to be judged at that point. If you've rejected Jesus, His sacrifice, then you'll be judged by the man He has appointed. What He's saying is you'll be judged based on the merits of Jesus. How do you stack up to Him? Anybody home with me? How do you stack up to Him? You'll be judged according to His merits. And how many of you know that the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard? Anybody with me? Somebody wants to take this from you. Hear it. Listen. God is not sending people to hell. Anybody hearing me? God is not sending people to hell. Instead, the reason for judgment day The reason for Judgment Day is to show that God is just. He's judging the world with justice. And so what does He do on Judgment Day? He allows you to be judged the way that you want to be judged. Please hear me, I beg of you. You have two choices. 
Really, you have two choices. You have two choices. Show me two fingers. Two choices. God made a way because he loves you. And the reason that he commands you to turn from your sin and turn to him is because there's a way for you to be right with God. Today is a day where you can have, you, you have that opportunity right now, at this very moment, you have that opportunity to turn from whatever it is that you depend on. All of your insecurities, all of those things that you've been stuck in, you have an opportunity to turn from and turn to Jesus and receive his sacrifice for your sins. Otherwise, the truth is, and God loves you so much, he tells you the truth, the truth is you'll be judged on your merits. And you can't be good enough. You can't. You can't stand up to the life of Jesus. You can't. So I beg of you, I beg of you, feel the Holy Spirit speak to your heart right now. I beg of you, listen to the Holy Spirit speak to you and receive Jesus Christ this morning. Begin a life with God today. Father God, we come to you right now, God, and uh, as some of us are, are wrestling with this decision, and really, you know, your word tells us to reason it out and come to you and reason it out because you want to forgive. You want us to come to you. I pray that as the Spirit speaks to your heart, that today would be the moment, you wouldn't let it go another second, that this would be the moment that you turn to Jesus. That you, you, you don't have to be perfect. That's not what it means to turn from your sin. It means to quit depending on that and depend on Jesus. And at this very moment, you can make that choice. Of course, you still have questions. Of course, you don't have all the answers. But you do know that God is speaking to your heart. You do know that God wants to call you to eternity with Him beginning right now. He wants to write your name down right now as a citizen of heaven. And so I just suggest a simple conversation with Him right now. It goes something like this. God, I come to you now. I, as best I can, I tell you, I know that I've come up short. I know I sin, I know that there's stuff in my life that shouldn't be. I'm a good person maybe, but compared to Jesus, I'm a bad person. But today, today I accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for my sins. And I ask you to come into my life you to fill me up with you. I, I want to live a different life now, a life depending on your power, your strength. And I trust in you instead of myself. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.